I saw Jesus crucified. I spoke to him as he died. I saw him in his struggle. I watched as he breathed his last breath and when he stopped breathing, I lost my breath too. The one who walked on water is no more. The one who fed 5,000 is now food for the worms and if he has been defeated, what does that mean for me? I thought that he would be the king who would rise up and rule our nation. I thought that we were the ones to bring truth and revelation, but it turns out we were wrong. I mean, maybe we imagined this all along. As I watched his body taken down from the cross, I saw my friend was gone, and he was the one who found me. How could this be? He must have gone before his time. It must have been too soon. It must have been an illusion or a dream. He can't be in a tomb. I can't come to grips with the thought that the man who claimed to be I am was slain by the hands of men. And then she burst through the door. Our friend Mary, she said, someone had taken the body of the Lord. So we ran to the tomb, only to find an empty room. And the stone was rolled away. I looked on the floor and I saw his clothes. And that's when I knew he rose. Jesus is alive. He did walk on water. He did feed the 5,000. He did raise Lazarus from the dead and heal thousands. He did make the wine. He did talk to God. He did pray for those who put him on the cross and he raised back to life. Just like Lazarus, except for he would never die again. Jesus took death, nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head for you. He laid his life down and he took it back again. Jesus is alive. Amen. Jesus is alive. Welcome and good Easter morning to you. Glad to have you here with us this morning. My name is Sam. I'm one of the elders. And whether it's your first time or you're a regular attender, we are so happy you're here with us this morning. Here at Lakeview, we exist to grow in Christ, to go in love, to teach God's word and to make disciples all for the glory of God. And we do that through a number of uh, different ministries, prayer, worship, discipleship, home groups, and local and, and international missions. We are so happy you're here with us this morning for whatever the reason. Maybe you're here for the very first time. Welcome, glad to have you here. Maybe you're here because your mom dragged you here. Hey, make my Easter special. Welcome, we are here to support your therapy. Maybe you're here <laughs> as a regular attender. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Maybe you're here because you were here at the, the, the first service and you wanna come back for more. Whatever the reason, welcome. Welcome to you, welcome to yours. Welcome home, welcome to Lakeview. Will you stand and join us in worship this morning?
was redeemed, only beauty remained, and my orphan heart was given to me. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance, when death was arrested in my life he Oh, your grace, so free, washes over I'm a prisoner no more. My shame 
was a ransom And he canceled my debt And he called me his friend When death was arrested in my life He cared Oh, your grace so Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with all freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested, and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. You brought 
Thank you. 
For the gift that we have with you resurrect, being resurrected, Lord, the gift of salvation, we're so, so grateful for that. Please help us to focus on your word today, Lord, what you have in store for us. We love you with all our hearts. Amen. You may be seated. Like you, church, he is risen. The year was AD 33. The week was, as scholars believe, March 29th through April 5th. This week is, without a doubt, the most important week in all of history. Into the outskirts of Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, came one who would change everything. The people praised triumphantly over the excitement of this king and his coming kingdom. They cried out in Mark chapter 11, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. But five days later, by the time the morning of Friday, April 3rd came, the kingdom looked completely crushed Because this king, our savior, was hanging on a cross. Shouts again filled the air, but this time it was not triumphant. It was horrific. This crowd did not scream Hosanna. Instead, they screamed out, crucify. Just a few days ago, we covered the agony that took place on Good Friday. Jesus died that day. The disciples went into hiding, not knowing what to do. The rest of that Friday, all of Saturday, Sunday morning, they were lonely, they were frightened, until in triumph over death, Jesus rose from the grave, remaking the very fabric of life. First he was seen by a few women, then by his disciples, then by many, many more. From that moment on, now and until Jesus returns, there will be this moment that we will celebrate each and every year called the resurrection. What's known as Easter to some is known as Resurrection Sunday to others, newsflash. It doesn't matter what you call it. What matters is Jesus is no longer dead. He is alive, and that's why we're here to celebrate this morning. It's why, actually, we celebrate every single Sunday, not just on Easter and Christmas Eve. Did you know that? (laughs) We gather every Sunday to make much of Jesus, not ourselves, not our little kingdom of Lakeview Church, but the kingdom of God. We gather every Sunday because Jesus is no longer dead. He is alive. He is risen. So to make much of this event and its continuing application today, which I believe the resurrection is still very applicable to our lives today, we're going to be looking at a passage in the book of Romans. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 6. We're going to start in verses first five, go all the way through verse 11. Let's read it in its entirety, then we'll break it down. Verse by verse. So Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 5, says this. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, he shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. 
We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Verse 10, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lived, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Will you join me in prayer? God, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for what you're doing in this place. God, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus, for what he accomplished on that cross. And we're even more thankful that he didn't stay on that cross. He didn't stay in the grave. Jesus, you are alive, and it's why we are here today to celebrate, to praise, and to worship the King of kings, the Lord of lords. So Holy Spirit, will you fill this place? Will you, will you challenge us in a new way this morning? And God, if there's anyone here that does not know you, that doesn't have a relationship with you, it is my prayer that today you would do a work in their heart, a work that only you can accomplish. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As a young middle school student learning how to write papers, maybe you remember this, I had a teacher once tell me the importance of the thesis statement. The statement, she would say, is so important because it tells your reader what you're going to tell them in the following essay. It reveals the, the grand purpose behind the content. It prepares the reader for what's to come. So in our passage this morning, we have one of those statements, one of these grand statements where Paul is preparing us as the reader for what is to come. His grand purpose statement is revealed. He lays all of his cards out on the table in one verse. So look at Verse number five, again, with me, Romans chapter six, verse number five. Paul says this, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul intends for us to, to somehow see this link between Jesus's death and Jesus's resurrection. But how do we see it? Well, it's through one key word, a really important word. It's a word that we don't just see here, we see echoed in, in all of the New Testament. It's a word that we found so important, we included it in our mission statement as a church. It's this idea of being united in Christ. In Christ. So the word we see here is united. If we're united with him in his death, then we shall be united with him in his resurrection. So the weight on understanding what Paul is telling us in this purpose statement lies in understanding the meaning of this word united. So what does it mean? To unite is to merge together. To unite is to bring into close connection. It is to join, to link, to couple, to incorporate, to merge what was once two separate things into one new thing. We know this word from common experience. We live in the United States. Some of us work alongside others in a union. Marriage is between two people coming together into a unity. But why does Paul mention this word here referring to Jesus's resurrection? He does so because there exists a reality in the Christian experience called our union with Christ. It is one of the major themes in the New Testament. In fact, it's so pervasive that it is often thought of as Paul's one major focus. If you were to boil down Paul's major themes, you said there's one major focus in all of his writings in the New Testament, it would be this. Anytime you see the words, in him, or in Christ, our union with Jesus is in view. In him, in Christ. Again, part of our mission statement here as a church, we exist to grow in Christ. 
Let me give you just a sample of some of Paul's teachings on this. And honestly, we could go on and on and on here. But Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 4. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him or in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Ephesians chapter one, starting in verse four, we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. In him, we have redemption through his blood. In him, we have obtained an inheritance. In him, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 6, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up, for in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily. We see our union with Christ on display in these passages, and, and this is just the sampling of the vast amount of Scripture referencing our being brought into union with Christ through faith. So let's get back to our verse this morning. Remember, the weight of understanding Romans 6, 5 lies on the word united. What then does Paul mean by saying, if we are united in Jesus' death with him, we will also be united with him in his resurrection? Paul continues to explain this. Look at verses 6 and 7. He says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. This Christian union with Christ, think about this, it goes so deep that if you are truly united with the Son of God by faith, it has consequences for your past. Your old self, your sinful nature was killed with Christ on the cross. Why was it killed with Christ? So that it would be brought to nothing and that we would therefore no longer be enslaved to sin. Which means if you're no longer in slavery to sin, you are now free and free indeed. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 8. You will know the truth. And who's the truth? Jesus. Good. If you don't know the answer and a pastor asks you, just say Jesus or the Bible. You'll probably be right. <laughs> you will know the truth. That's Jesus. And the truth will set you free. It is so interesting to me that people will often say, well, I, I don't want to come to church. I'm not interested in Christianity because they see, and this is kind of like a very worldly view of Christianity, they see it as like just this giant set of do's and don'ts, right? Christianity is just a big old set of rules, and I'm like my own boss. I want to do my own thing. I want to be free. I don't want to be trapped under the heavy burden of having to, to live by this set of rules. But I promise you, if you trust in Christ, you will find that freedom that you've been looking for. What this world has to offer is not freedom. It is slavery. What Jesus has to offer is life and life to the full. The greatest freedom found in all the world is when one gives up their quote-unquote freedom to believe in Jesus and follow him. Jesus himself said it like this in Matthew chapter 10, if you lose your life for my sake and the gospels, you will find it. Many of us are searching for purpose. We are searching for meaning. Some of you, you're on the treadmill. You're just doing the same thing over and over and over, day after day after day. You hear the same sound every morning, and you feel like Bill Murray trapped in Groundhog Day, right? <laughs> like you're just going over and over and over. And I'm telling you, Jesus has come to get you off that treadmill. The wisest fool to ever live, King Solomon, can't seem to get away from this guy. We've been studying him for a couple of months now, the book of Ecclesiastes. This is his whole life's purpose, to find meaning, to find purpose, to find something of satisfaction, to find something that would make it worthwhile. So he tries everything. Some of you are there. You've tried it all. He tried money. He tried sex. He tried relationships. He tried houses. He's tried job after job after job. He tried music. He tried the arts. He tried everything you could possibly imagine. 
And he came back with the same thing over and over. It's worthless. It's meaningless. It's vanity. Why? Because true worth and true value is not going to be found in the things of this world. It is only going to be found in Jesus. You're only going to find purpose and meaning and life in Christ, in our union with Christ, united with Christ. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said it like this, give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose yourself and you will save it. Paul goes on in verses 8 through 10. He says, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lived, he lives to God. So Paul now moves on to the subject, which he introduced to us in the thesis statement of this argument. We believe if we died with Jesus, we will also rise with Jesus. It's a critical part of our faith. Jesus is the head of the body. If the head goes this way or that way, so goes the body. If the head dies, so does the body. And praise God that if the head is raised from death, the body will be raised from death as well. Paul goes further, moving into really the deep waters of the implications of the resurrection. Because Jesus died and rose, he will never die again. He doesn't have to come and do this thing again. It's already been happened. He is taking care of it. It's been satisfied. Now the victorious life he lived, he lives to God. He died to sin in his death, but now the life he lives, he lives to God. Only God can do this. Only those united to this God will be and do the same by their union with him. Paul says if Jesus rose from his death, he's never going to die again. Then it follows that if we've placed our faith in Jesus and thus we become united with Christ, we will never die again. We can be assured that after our death, we shall be raised as he was never to die again. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. This sermon is titled The Fruit of Resurrection because that's what we see in this text. Jesus rose from the grave, and because of this, his resurrection bears fruit in those who are in union with him. He rose never to die again. One day, we too will stand where he is. Jesus, by his resurrection, shows himself to be the most unique person in the history of the world. You can stack up any major leader ever to walk this planet up against Jesus. Gandhi, Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, L. Ron Hubbard, and countless other people who lived their lives, taught people, had these massive followings. They all have one thing in common. When they died, they stayed dead. They're still dead. Insert Jesus. He lived a life unlike any other. He, too, taught a lot of things. He also gained a massive amount of followers. Here's the difference. When Jesus died, he didn't stay dead. Jesus is alive. This is why we can call Good Friday good, because he didn't stay on the cross. He didn't stay in the grave. He is alive. He is risen. This is why we gather on Resurrection Sunday to celebrate our risen Savior who is still alive. The grave could not hold our Savior down. Jesus said it himself in John chapter 10, verse 18, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to pick it up again. So what does this mean? This means you cannot just call Jesus a good man or a prophet. He would have to be a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. Those are our only options on the table. You can't call this man good if he just fooled millions and millions and potentially billions of people. He would be the greatest con man in the history of the world. He's either a liar, he's either a lunatic, 
for he is Lord. Romans 1.4 says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. So what proves his deity? How do we know that Jesus is God? This is how we know. Because he didn't stay dead. And then he appeared to hundreds of people. We have eyewitness accounts of people who saw Jesus die and then they saw him alive. This is how we know he is who he says he is. The implications of this, is, they're stunning. We have a Savior who can never die again. We have a Savior who can be with us until the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20, behold, I am with you always. We, as a people, can now be born again. 1 Peter 1, 3, by his great mercy, we have been born again to a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We now have the forgiveness of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised and your, and your hope is futile and you're still in your sins, but Christ has been raised, we now have no condemnation if you're united to Jesus. Romans 8, 34, who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God. We can now trust that all wrongs will one day be righted at the coming judgment. Acts 17, 31. God has fixed a day on which people he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead. We can be assured of our own resurrection from the dead. 2 Corinthians 4, 14. We know that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring you into his presence. Lakeview Church, we have the indisputable, life-giving Savior of the world. By his resurrection, Jesus stands forth as the victor, as the conqueror of death, as the conqueror of hell, and all that would try to oppose him. He has burst the bands of death. He has trampled the darkness decisively. By the resurrection, we know that his sacrifice on the cross was accepted, that the very wrath of God was satisfied. We can call Good Friday good because Sunday actually happened. This is not a, Mabel, this isn't a fable, a myth, this isn't folklore. We believe this to be true. In Christ we died, in him we rise. In his life we live, and in his victory we triumph. In his glorification we shall one day be glorified. He was crowned with thorns. He's now wreathed with glory. No shame was deeper than the cross, no agony more bitter, no death more cruel. Now, no exaltation is higher, no life more glorious, no advocate more effective. In Christ, the new man has arrived on the stage of history, and now, by his grace, he is creating new men out of every people, every tribe, every nation, every tongue. Romans chapter 6, verse 11, the very last verse in our text this morning, gives us one final implication of the resurrection. Paul says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Because of Jesus' work on our behalf, if... It's a big if here. If we are in union with him by faith, we must consider ourselves as Jesus considered himself before God. We are now dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. As sin can no longer have power against the Son of God, sin no longer has power against the sons and daughters of God. As Jesus is now completely alive, never to die again, so too we have been given an incorruptible life, never to fade away or vanish. Lakeview Church, don't miss this thing that has been staring us in the face this entire time. These promises are not for those who come to church twice a year. These promises are not for those who come to church every Sunday of the year. These promises are not for those who said a magical prayer at VBS when they were five years old. These promises are not for those who do a really good job at reading their Bible and praying every day. These promises are for those who are in Christ, who have a union with Christ. So this is, this is the question before us this morning. Are you in him? Are you in Christ? Do you have a relationship with Christ? You're like, oh, great. Here's the point where he's going to try to convert me. Yes, that's why I'm here. I want you to be a Christian. I want you to experience this life. 
that oh, it's only offered by Christ. You know, it's like a bait and switch. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. I want you to believe in Jesus. And there's a lot of the people who want you to do the same because they too have gone from death to life just as Jesus has gone from death to life. There are countless stories in this room of people who have searched for meaning and purpose and meaning and purpose and they've tried and they've tried and they've tried and nothing matters, nothing lasts, nothing satisfies. Only Jesus Christ can fill that void. And you know what I'm talking about. It's that void that you try to fill with everything this world has to offer. Are you sick of trying to fill it? Will you come to Christ? Will you lay your burdens down at his feet? Will you finally declare, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a savior, and you are the only one that can save me? Are you united in him by faith? If not, he is willing and alive and he will save you. Will you come to him? Will you come to Jesus? Who can command the highest praise? Who has the name above all names? It is only Jesus. Only Jesus stands alone. So we stand amazed. So here's what I want us to do this morning. We're going to enter into a time of prayer. We're going to, we're going to go out singing and praising the one who deserves all glory and all honor and all praise. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we enter into a time of prayer now? Jesus, because you are alive, we can have life. It is because you didn't stay on the cross and you didn't even stay in that grave that we are even here today. Jesus, this is pointless if the resurrection didn't actually happen. But because it did, it changes everything. So God, will you work and move in a way that only you can work and move. If there's anybody here that does not know you, that doesn't have a relationship with you, or maybe they're just sick and tired of the treadmill of life and trying everything to fill that void, and maybe this morning they're realizing that nothing else is going to satisfy. It is only you, King Jesus, our resurrected Savior, that can do that. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, and we stand amazed because of you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand amazed before Jesus now? my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your
Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us here at Lakeview Church on this beautiful Easter Sunday. Uh, I want to invite you back. We gather each and every Sunday at 9-11. We sing songs to and about the King of Kings. I shout for like half an hour, and we just have a great time every week. So uh, I want to invite you to come back and join us. But will you now go in the grace and knowledge and peace that can only come from our risen Savior, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, will you go in the name of Jesus. Amen.